Hello, my name is John Holmes. I'm Professor of Victorian Literature and Culture at the University of Birmingham. As part of our year-long Arts and Sciences Festival, we're moving on in the spring now to think about the topic of hope. I was going to give a lecture on poetry before the university had to close down on account of the COVID-19 crisis, and somehow that theme of poetry and hope seems now all the more pertinent than it did before we had to enter the lockdown. I want to think a little bit today with you about what poetry can offer in a time of crisis, in particular what poetry can offer us in the way of hope. The current crisis has led to an odd burgeoning of the arts. It's a strange thing to say because of course many people have been left out of work and uh, lots and lots of artistic institutions have had to close, but we've seen concerts being recorded on Zoom and distributed around the world. We've seen uh, the National Theatre streaming major productions of its plays. Uh, there's been poetry read on Radio 4 every day. So clearly there's a sense that the arts can offer us something now that we need in this time. But what about poetry particularly? What can poetry offer us and what hope can it offer us? I think the first thing to say about poetry is that it's a slow art form. It's an art form that you have to take your time over. In fact, to read poetry is to take a moment's pause. Now, of course, in a way, we're all taking a moment's pause from our lives at the moment. It's as if the pause button's been pushed. We're all waiting to know when we can start again. But that moment of pause has given us time to reflect time for what's come to be known, I think, recently as, as mindfulness. And poetry is a very mindful art form. It makes us think, but it also makes us feel. We have to digest it. We read it slowly. We read it ideally aloud. And we feel it in our bodies. When, you, when a poem brings a tear to your eye, for example, or sends a shiver down your spine, that's a sign that poetry is a full body art form. It's embodied in, not as obviously as drama, for example, but nevertheless, it is absolutely an embodied art form. So poetry gives us these moments to pause, these moments of, of mindfulness, these times to reflect on what really matters, on what we really value. And a time also to reflect on our memories and how the memories of others speak to our own. The poet William Wordsworth had a phrase for this. He talked about spots of time in his poem, The Prelude. And particularly, he wrote, thinking here about his own memory, but it applies to all of our memories. He wrote, there are in our existence spots of time that with distinct preeminence retain a renovating virtue, whence our minds are nourished and invisibly repaired, a virtue by which pleasure is enhanced, that penetrates, enables us to mount, when high, more high, and lifts us up when fallen. This capacity of poetry to capture these spots of time and communicate them to other, others is one of its real strengths. It's one of the things that it can offer us now in a moment of crisis is to hear voices from the past, from other places, from other times of people going through experiences that recall or anticipate more precisely the, the experiences we're going through now. Of course, the most profound experience that has been felt by people during the COVID-19 crisis has been the experience of loss. The experience of bereavement is the most intense version of that. But of course, we've all lost many things. We've lost contact with people. We've lost those daily uh, interactions that we depend upon. We've lost the chance to go places, the chance to do things. We may have lost our um, working lives in some sense, or at least the practicalities of them. But that loss of bereavement, of course, puts all of that in perspective, and that's why so many governments around the world have decided quite rightly to prioritise human life over uh, economic necessities, if you like, or economic um, uh, stabilities. Now, poetry can talk to us very profoundly about loss, and I want to share a couple of poems with you today that do that, and that help us to grapple not only with loss itself, but with the movement beyond bereavement, 
the, the, the change to the next stage, the stage of, of processing that experience. Of course, there are so many of these poems. One could pick 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 uh, any number, but I'm gonna gonna home in on a couple that are a special favourites of mine. The first one because it speaks to us from a time when we really wouldn't expect, I think, to find ourselves hearing the words of somebody that uh, that we recognise so profoundly as as experiencing what we experience. I want to take you back to the 17th century. I'm going to read you a section of a poem from um, the 1620s. In 1624, a man called Henry King lost his wife. Henry King was a, a clergyman in London uh, at St Paul's. He went on to become a bishop later in life. Henry King was in his early 30s. His wife Anne was only 23 and she died. And he wrote a poem memorialising her. He called it an exequy, which means a, a rite for the dead, a ritual for the dead. But it's not a ritualistic poem. It's not a, uh, a poem that is highly formulaic or um, structured according to conventions. It's a very personal poem, a very private poem in some ways. Uh, and I hope you'll agree with me when you hear it. It's a very beautiful and, and moving uh, tribute to Anne and account of um, his feelings towards her and, and a tribute to their love. Uh, the poem, the section I'm going to begin you read you, which begins in the that's about halfway through the poem, is begins with an address to the earth where she's buried, and then it moves on to an address to Anne herself. Uh, and the poet is thinking here, Henry King is thinking here about reunion with his dead wife in due course in time, and time therefore becomes an image for the the movement towards that moment. Of coming back together. So here is a, a selection then from an exequy by Henry King. Meantime thou hast her, earth, much good may my harm do thee. Since it stood with heaven's will I might not call her longer mine, I give thee all my short-lived right and interest in her whom living I loved best. With a most free and bounteous grief, I give thee what I could not keep. Be kind to her, and prithee look thou right into thy doomsday book, each parcel of this rarity which in thy casket shrined doth lie. So close the ground, and bout her shade, black curtains draw, my bride is laid. Sleep on, my love, in thy cold bed, never to be disquieted, my last good night. Thou wilt not wake till I thy fate shall overtake, till age or grief or sickness must marry thy my body to that dust it so much loves, and feel, fill the room my heart keeps empty in thy tomb. Stay for me there, I will not fail to meet thee in that hollow vale, and think not much of my delay, I am already on the way, and follow thee with all the speed desire can make or sorrows breed. Each minute is a short degree, and every hour a step towards thee. At night, when I betake to rest, next morn I rise nearer my west of life, almost by eight hours' sail, than when sleep breathes his drowsy gale. The thought of this bids me go on and wait my dissolution, with hope and comfort. Dear, forgive the crime, I am content to live, divided, with but half a heart, Till we shall meet and never part. For me, this is an immensely touching poem. The, the personal quality of the address, the way he speaks to Anne as my love, or says to her, my last good night, is very, very moving. And he's there also admitting that this is, even in the process of, of um, a kind of bounteous grief, a grief that is overflowing. He is still finding his way towards hope and comfort, towards an accommodation, um, an acceptance that life must go on in the meantime. I particularly love that image of time moving and him moving with time towards that moment of reunion. And that is a sailing journey, a journey towards the west, of course, the west of life, the sunset of life. It's an, it's an elegant conceit, actually, but it's also a almost a kind of shared joke is the wrong word but a shared um indulgence in an idea that he and Anne have together 
something that she might appreciate. And it did indeed take him a long, long time to reunite with her. It was another 45 years that Henry King lived on. He lived to the age of 77, very old in his time, till the, to um, 1669. So he lived to see uh, not only this very personal crisis, but of course the national crisis of the Civil War. I want to turn now to a much more recent voice, a much more recent poem, but which also I think speaks to our moment, and it speaks to our moment partly because of its recognition of loss, and its recognition that even when you lose somebody, you retain them, they're with you, you're there, you're able to remember them, to recall them, to speak with them. This is a poem called Kew Gardens, uh, it's one of my favourite poems again, it's by D.M. Black, who's a Scottish poet of, of South African, um, uh, Southern African origin. And it's addressed to his father, Ian Black, who was a botanist. Um, it's in memoriam of Ian, uh, Ian Black. Um, I'll explain to you after I've read it why I think it's so pertinent to, to our precise crisis moment now. But also, I hope you'll just enjoy listening to it and enjoy the experience. So this is Kew Gardens addressed to Ian Black, uh, Ian Black's father. Distinguished scientist, to whom I greatly defer, old man, moreover, whom I dearly love, I walk today in Kew Gardens, in sunlight the colour of honey, which flows from the cold autumnal blue of the heavens to light these tans and golds. These ripe corn and leather and sunset colours of the East Asian liriodendrons, of the beeches and maples and plum trees, and the stubborn green banks of the holly hedges. And you walk always beside me, you with your knowledge of names and your clairvoyant gaze in what for me is sheer panorama, seeing the net or web of connectedness. But today it is I who speak, and you are long dead, but it is to you I say it. The leaves are green in summer because of chlorophyll, and the flowers are bright to lure the pollinators, and without remainder, so you have often told me, these marvellous things that shock the heart, the head can account for. But I want to sing an excess which is not so simply explainable, to say that the beauty of the autumn is a redundant beauty, that the sky had no need to be this particular shade of blue, nor the maple to die in flames of this particular yellow, nor the heart to respond with an ecstasy that does not forget children. I want to say that I do not believe your science, although I believe every word of it, and intend to understand it. That although I rate that unwavering gaze higher than almost everything, there is another sense, a hearing, to which I more deeply attend. Thus I withstand and contradict you. I, your child, who have inherited from you the passion which causes me to oppose you. There are so many reasons why I wanted to share this poem with you, and why I think it's appropriate for our particular moment. Maybe the first and most obvious is, of course, that it's a poem about loss, in a sense. It's a poem about um, remembering somebody who died some while before, remembering them and knowing that you can still engage with them. You can not only recall them, but you can even enter into a kind of dialogue with them. Um, and of course, that relationship between Black and his father is one that is really intensely uh, captured, as in, captured as intensely loving within this poem. Old man, moreover, whom I dearly love, is the second line of the poem. So partly it's a poem about a, a relationship, the loss of an elder relative, but the persistence of that person within one's life and mind. It's also a poem about nature, or perhaps more precisely, we could say about gardens and parks. Kew Gardens is at the moment sadly closed, but many parks are open and many of us have found the fact that the parks are open a lifeline really during these times. And we've been able to appreciate uh, living things. Think about that, that catalogue of the beauty of plants and the colours that Black captures in his poem. I think we can all appreciate that engagement with parks and gardens. It's a poem too about science. Now more than ever we've come to know that like Black speaking that poem, we need to believe 
the science, but we need to understand the science too. And yet at the same time, I think like Black, we've come to know too that the science is not everything. That um, human reactions and responses can't always been reduced, be reduced to something scientific. That we need to appreciate those in themselves. We need to hear those as well as to see the science. And he uses that contrast between sight and sound, sight for the science, sound for sound for poetry really. Poetry is an auditory art form. It works through voice, it works through its sound in our ears. And by hearing that beauty captured, we can recapture our own sense of the importance of beauty as against merely function, utility, that which can be explained as such. So it's a poem that directs us to what we value and helps us to remember and think about what we value in a moment of loss, in a moment where access to the outside is so important to us. Now, it may seem odd that I've spent a, a lecture that is supposed to be about poetry and hope talking principally about grief and loss. But of course, that's the crisis we're living through. It's a moment of loss. And to find the hope, we need to face the loss. We need to um, move through it. And poetry can help us to do that, I think, by hearing the voices of others, uh, Henry King, all those centuries ago, D.M. Black, a much closer contemporary to, of ours, uh, feeling their own loss, responding to their own loss, processing it. Also, I think we have a need to be honest in these moments. There's a, a line that always sticks with me from Thomas Hardy's poem in Tenebris, the second of a series of three poems of that title that he wrote, uh, when he talks about himself as one who holds that if way to the better there be, it exacts a full look to the worst. In other words, we need to be alert to the risks, the dangers, uh, the worst possible effects if we're going to find our way to a better world. And that's true of COVID-19. Uh, it's true of the crisis we're in. But it's also, I'm afraid, uh, even more profoundly true of the even more profound crisis that we are in long term, which is the environmental catastrophe that we're experiencing. COVID-19 is, in a way, a harbinger of a much worse crisis, a much worse, uh, a much more real apocalypse, one might say. This is what the, the, the Climate Change Committee has recently explained in its letter to the government, calling for um, the movement out of COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis, to be also a movement to address the crisis of climate change and environmental degradation, which we need very profoundly to deal with. We've all seen over the last 10 uh, years, 20 years, um, an extraordinary, terrifying escalation in extreme weather events, whether we're talking about hurricanes in the Caribbean and on the coast of America, or wildfires in California and Australia and the Amazon, perhaps most terrifyingly, and of course abetted there by human activity. Whether we're thinking about flooding uh, in Bangladesh or in our own homes here in Britain, whether we're thinking about drought across the continent of Europe, um, these changes are happening, they're happening now, they're happening rapidly, much more rapidly indeed than the science had projected that they would happen. You can see that with the levels of, of uh, ice melt in the Arctic, for example, uh, the impending sea level rises. And of course, this is, uh, and indeed, not to mention the other effects of human activity on the environment. We all know about plastic pollution in the sea. We all know about air pollution in our cities and towns. And this is going to have, it's already having, but it's going to have ever more profound human effect. Uh, it's going to lead to population migrations. It's going to lead to food shortages. It's hard to see those not in turn leading to wars and, of course, diseases, unless we address the problem, unless we do something about it, unless we find the hope that we need to do something about it. And I think poetry can play a role in finding that hope for us. We know the role that the science must play. We know that we must understand it. We have to believe it because it is our best data. It's the thing that is telling us what is happening. But at the same time, we need poetry. We need the arts and we need them more than for any other purpose, I think, for hope and for the imagination. Because if we are going to get to a world which is sustainable for us to live in, if we're going to move beyond 
simple recapitulation of um, the kind of rapid activity, consumption, production, uh, draining of the Earth's resources, which we saw before COVID-19, and which actually COVID-19 has given us pause to think about and has slowed momentarily, has slowed down those processes, it allowed us to imagine and indeed experience a world in which the air is cleaner. It's given us quite literally a breather. But if we're going to get beyond this, we need to seize that moment. But we also need to be able to imagine what world we're going to. To imagine other ways of living in relation to nature, in relation to each other, other forms of economy, of course, but also other forms of value, other things to value. The value, in fact, that we found ourselves placing or been reminded of uh, for ourselves through the COVID-19 crisis, the value of human relations, the value of the arts, the value of the natural world around us, the value of those things that we miss, but particularly selectively those things that we miss. Which are the things we miss most? Each other, probably, and the world around us. So we need to get to this place. The role of poetry is partly to inspire us to get to it. Poetry is one of the most powerful forms of language for inspiration, for moving people, and also to imagine it. There's a phrase, a formula, a formulation that the poet Posey Shelley came up with at the end of his essay, Defense of Poetry, around 200 years ago, where he said that poets are the higher offense of an unapprehended inspiration. They're the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present. And he closed that essay by saying, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. These are very grandiose claims, but what Shelley means by the poet is the person who is capable of imagining things other than as they are, who's capable of imagining that, communicating that, not necessarily knowing even that that is what they're doing, but who in freeing up their imagination can take us to somewhere new. And by poet, as I, he doesn't just mean a writer in verse, he means other kinds of imaginative and creative writer and artist. Uh, in our own time, we might think of science fiction writers or fantasy writers, any writer, any artist, any filmmaker who is not trapped within a presumption that the present is the way things are and have to be. Shelley wrote at the end of his poem Prometheus Unbound about the need to hope till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. Hope has to face despair, hope has to triumph over despair. And Shelley of course was himself a great prophet of democratization, equality, um, fairer, human relations, many of which have come into being in one form or another. More freedom, more personal freedom is another thing he was a great prophet of. So poetry can help us, I think, get to that kind of uh, new world where we need to be. It can help us hope and it can help us to imagine. I want to close then with one last poem by, uh, for my money, so far as I know, the, one of the greatest Australian poets of the 20th century, perhaps the greatest Australian poet of all, certainly one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. Her name was Judith Wright. Uh, she was um, uh, also a, a great campaigner for Aboriginal rights for the environment in Australia. And she wrote a poem in 1973, the year I was born, uh, which seems extraordinarily prescient now. It was called Lament for Passenger Pigeons. And it's a poem about human induced extinction. The passenger pigeon is uh, probably, well, it's one of the most famous instances of, of human induced extinction. It was probably the most abundant bird in the world uh, in the 19th century. It flocked literally in billions across the United States of America. Um, but through intense and wanton hunting and also through deforestation uh, the populations of passenger pigeons collapsed until there were only a few individuals left and uh, it's one of the very few species when we can pinpoint the exact moment that it went extinct which was on September the 1st in uh, 1914 um, around one o'clock the, the the zookeeper in Cincinnati Zoo where the last passenger pigeon lived her name was Martha uh, was on his rounds, he went past her cage, she was still alive, 15 minutes later he went past again and she was dead. That's the moment the passenger pigeon 
went extinct. Now the passenger pigeon is a symbol of the impact we have had on the natural world and the wanton destruction that we've had, we, we, we've made, we've taken on the natural world. But for, for Judith Wright it's more than just that, it's also a symbol of our uh, insistence on valuing things uh, functionally, valuing things according to what use they have for us. She starts ironically with a quotation, don't ask for the meaning, ask for the use, from the philosopher Wittgenstein, and this is the, the adage that she's going to challenge in this poem. And it's a poem um, that, as Hardy says, exacts a full look at the worst. It's a gruelling poem, it's a poem that uh, starts with and runs into a deep condemnation of human activity and yet it ends on a note of hope. It ends on the possibility that we can change our values, we can change the world uh, that we live in as a result. And this is the poem I want to, to close with. So this is Lament for Passenger Pigeons by Judith Wright. The voice of water as it flows and falls, the noise air makes against earth surfaces have changed, are changing to the tunes we choose. What wooed and echoed in the pigeon's voice? We have not heard the bird. How reinvent that passenger, its million wings and hues, when we have lost the bird, the thing itself, the sheen of life on flashing long migrations? Might human musics hold it? Could we hear? Trapped in the fouling nests of time and space, we turn the music on, but it is man, and it is man who leans a deafening ear, and it is man we eat, and man we drink, and man who thickens round us like a stain. Ice of the polar axis smells of men. A word, a class, a formula, a use, that is the rhythm, the cycle we impose. The sirens sang us to the ends of sea and changed to us. Their voices were our own, jug jug to dirty ears and dirty brine. Pigeons and angels sang us to the sky and turned to metal and a dirty need. The height of sky, the depth of sea, we are sick with a yellow stain, a fouling dye. Whatever being is, that formula, it dies as we pursue it past the word. We have not asked the meaning but the use. What is the use of water when it dims, the use of air that whines of emptiness, the use of glass-eyed pigeons caged in glass? We listen to the sea, that old machine, to air that horsens on earth's surfaces and has no angel, no migrating cry. What is the being and the end of man? Blank surfaces reverb a human voice whose echo tells us that we choose to die. Or else, against the blank of everything, to reinvent that passenger, that bird, siren and angel image we contain, essential in a constellating word, to sing of being, its escaping wing, to utter absence in a human chord and recreate the meaning as we sing. What Judith Wright holds out for us in this poem is the possibility that poetry can revive for us something that's gone. It can recalibrate our values. It can enable us to imagine the world in a different way, to think about it differently, to experience it differently. Uh, to revive it and ourselves through that process. So poetry not only preserves the memories and values that have always meant so much for us, it enables us to recapture them. It enables us to reach towards a new possibility. If collectively we can now, we can imagine the new world that is on the far side of this crisis and on the far side too of the far deeper crisis that our own making, if we can imagine it, we can reach it and poetry can help us to do that. Thank you.